This episode of Untold Stories is sponsored by SafePal and AngelBlock. You'll hear more about them later on in this episode. How do you get really large traders? We need tons of liquidity so they can make large trades and get low slippage, which means better prices. Okay, great. But like, if that's what you're focused on, then like, you're not actually focused on what's best for small traders. And what's best for small traders? Well, I guess low, like, they don't need that much liquidity because they're small trades. They want low fees. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Happy Monday, happy Tuesday, happy Wednesday. Whenever you're listening to the episode, maybe on even on a Thursday, Friday, or Saturday, or Sunday, I am your host, Charlie Shrem, and you're listening to another epic episode of Untold Stories, where twice a week together, we get to dive deep with some of crypto's most influential leaders, those who are kind of running these massive ecosystems that we hear about and we really want to understand like what's going on there why is there tens of thousands of people living their lives in these metaverses in these web3 communities in these DAOs? like what is happening there talk about bitcoin we talk about stable coins we talk about i don't even like to use that term we talk about the macro world of the day we talk about what coffee i'm drinking uh we really talk about really anything through bull and bear markets we've had some amazing, amazing rides together um, with the guests, with the listeners. We, I love having some of the guests back on a year later and talk about kind of what they've been up to. Um, and it's great. The summer is is waning. We have the autumn, you know, and the winter season coming for the rest of the world. And people are coming back to their desks. They're trading again. They're looking into their, their taxes and their bills and they're saying, shit, I need to make some money for the next year to figure this out. No more summer travel. And so we're getting now into like where we're tucking in and we're, we're going to be building and launching some stuff. And you'll see a lot of that come out of the different earning seasons and the different trading type of things that are happening on in the various stock markets around the world. But um, I feel like I'm being rude. I have to introduce my amazing guest today, Mark Lurie. Thank you so much for coming on Untold Stories. Hi, Charlie. And hi, everyone. Thanks so much for having me. How's your weekend? It was great. I got to do two hikes. I just moved up to... Uh, New Hampshire, a little bit up from Boston, and uh, and I'm exploring the town forests around here. It's perfect leaf uh, peeping season. They're all red and orange, and it's great. Are you? Um, that's the one thing about I miss about um, about living in Florida is I miss the seasons. I mm. went up to like the Baltimore area last week, and I got to see some uh, colors of leaves changing and stuff like that. But here, it's just hot and hotter of the seasons. But New Hampshire is actually the birthplace of some of the earliest Bitcoin communities in the in the world. Um, are you like, do you engage with like the free state movement at all or any like the crypto people up there? I don't, you know, it's it's a very libertarian state and I have a proud license plate now that says live free or die on it, Love which it. I like a lot. Uh, but no, I actually just moved here um, and uh, it's, it's closer to my wife's work. And uh, so we're like about 40 minutes north of Boston. And it's it's really um, it's kind right. of coincidence. We had um, Bruce Fenton on this show and he ran for for Senate as like and he was one of the earliest Bitcoin OGs in the space. Like he got involved very early on, um, like I think 2013 and fostered and built a lot of communities. He was like the first uh, securities a uh, broker that understood crypto and securities laws and was like preaching the whole like we need regulation very very early on he mm -hmm. didn't win but he learned a lot and he lives he has a big farm that he invites people to come visit near i forget which town in new hampshire but um there's not that many probably yeah. manchester concord and manchester <laughs> it's right it's right near manchester <laughs> think up with him yeah well well that's right near me so you'll have to introduce us i'd love to i will you. Um, but you have your your time is uh, is fine. You have a lot of stuff going on. Um, you're the CEO and co-founder of Shipyard Software, which builds decentralized exchanges for a specific type of trades, traders, and instruments. And you have Clipper, which is I'm going to try to like break it down for everyone. You could tell me where. Uh, and you have Clipper, which is a decentralized exchange that gets everyone the best prices and the you know and does liquidity pools across multiple assets, multiple blockchains. And it's all governed by the Admiral DAO. And we went through all of, you know, all the documentation, the com your communities, what's going on there. And it's like very robust. Of course, you understand building communities and marketing. You've been around the space for a long time. 
uh, um, you were VC at Bessemer Venture Partners. One of your first invest investments was Twilio, and um, uh, which was an amazing company. I read the memo that you have on the website, oh. but I, I remember actually we just talked about Twilio on a previous episode last week. Uh, can you talk about actually why Twilio was really was a huge watershed moment for connecting kind of like web one and web two? Sure. Well, you know, at the time, uh, and this was post-financial crisis, so this was sometime between 2008 and 2010, um, you know, developer first APIs to make very things that were very complex behind the scenes, simple for developers, uh, were becoming increasingly prominent. So Stripe was also first seeing traction around then. And, uh, you know, and, you know, I think in, in one of the benefits of Web2 is you have all these services that can interact together and developers can in some ways compose, right? And they do that through APIs. Um, and uh, uh, and so um, Stripe was showing that this could have some real benefits. And at the time I was teaching myself to code um, and I c coded up uh, a basic app that would basically take... Um, take, you know, alerts about weather, severe weather, terrorist warnings, whatever it is, and route them to people's phones as they're traveling. Uh, it was kind of a, a toy to figure out, you know, to, to help give myself a reason to motivate myself to code. And so I was working with Asterix and like trying to interact. And I realized you had to interact with like each of these cell networks separately yeah. and, and develop them separately. And it was just like way too complicated. And in parallel, you know, my colleague, Ethan Kurzweil, uh, you know, was also looking into developer tools. And so we realized, hey, this is like a very, you know, if we're going to have a bunch of different applications be able to interact with each other, like it needs to, we need to abstract away the complexity. And obviously, you know, Jeff and, and Twilio were several steps ahead of us, which is the nature of entrepreneurs and VCs. Um, and so we were excited to meet him. And I think we slowed a, slid a, a check to him across a coffee table um, and gave him, you know, uh, one of his early, uh, early checks because we were very excited about what he was doing and he was really experienced in the space. And, you know, I think that just very much played out. Um, and he's obviously an amazing executor. I remember when Twilio it was like 2011 and I was just fresh out of college and I had been deep in the Bitcoin rabbit hole. And I was like, I was like really deep in it. I was not eating or sleeping. I was living on the forums all day. One of my closest friends who I went, we went to, you know, 12 years of, of yeshiva together. He got a job right out of school working at Twilio. I think it was like the, one of the first 20 employees. And I remember looking at that and saying, if I wasn't in Bitcoin, that's where I'd want to be. This is at the time, because I saw it as you had these like cell networks that enabled mass communication between people, but there was no relationship between cell networks, SMS and and the internet and, and developer tools and APIs. So like the idea of like two factor authentication and being able to like send SMS alerts and what you just described, every airline app does nowadays on default, but the basic ideas, you didn't have that. And here we are 10 years later and we've gotten so far in like the technological growth, but you were kind of a, a, a VC in investing in these companies. Why jump ship? to build shipyard. Oh, you get that? No, oh, I like it. Great pun. Um, so <laughs> there's a few a few reasons. One is, uh, you know, I, I very much believe in crypto. Like one, one thing that held, this is not the most important reason, but just because it ties to what we just spoke about. Uh, w one learning from Twilio for me is that one of the concerns at the time was, well, what's the actual use case? Like, how big is this market for just making it easier for developers to use SMS? Like, they can still do it another way. They can integrate with each. Like, how much value is really being added here? And what's the use case? What's the market size? If we can't even put our finger on, like, where the revenue is specifically coming from right now. And, you know, in retrospect, that's a little bit of a silly concern, right? Like, on the one hand, yes, that's obviously a very valid concern. On the other hand... You know, when you you unleash it, when you create things that make it easier for people to do things in new ways and uh, more easily, it like un 
unleashes a bunch of innovation. And I think it's reasonable to kind of take a leap of faith that like, well, there's going to be a ton of use cases. Like when it's obvious, it's obvious. And I think crypto is very much the same where it's like, you know, there's definitely some use cases we've found so far, right? But there's a lot of use cases people have talked about that haven't panned out. But it's it's clearly a new way of doing things. It's clearly a new way of being able to fit things together. It, it allows people to custody their own funds. And so like, it's just very obviously going to be big, even though it's hard at any one point to put your finger on exactly where the market size is. And so I think that's one really interesting thing about Twilio. And I think it's those kind of environments where you can create real impact long-term uh, because it's a little less obvious. Um, so that's just one random thought. But I think like, you know, why I jump ship is very personal. Uh, I think VC is a fantastic life uh, and, and probably a better risk adjusted return than entrepreneurship uh, from a career perspective. But, you know, it's also a hard industry. You can only be good at it if you live and breathe it. If you just, all you think about is deals and which companies, you know, it's like that, that kid who traded baseball cards and just knew all the baseball cards and yeah. all the stats like that. You got to be that guy. If you want to be successful at BC, you kind of got to be that guy uh, or girl around deals. And I didn't care that much. I was thinking in the shower about like a good idea to start and a building something. And, you know, and it, at the point where that's, what you're thinking about, you can't really be successful in a very competitive market uh, with a bunch of people who are thinking about actual, you know, VC and doing deals. And so I just decided, like, I don't have much of a choice. I got to go build things because it's all I think about. That's going to be part of my edge, you know. When I when I do that, I want to do it. And uh, you know, and and while it's hard to jump ship from VC, you know, it's much harder to, in a lot of ways, to be like a, a artist or creator. You know, yeah. doing uh, startups and building businesses is is a is also a good life. It just takes some emotional fortitude. It's exhausting. It is exhausting. Ben Horowitz has a great article, "The Struggle." It's a great blog post, and I think anyone who wants to start a business needs to read that first because it it is uh, gospel. I'm literally going to go read it right after the show. So, so how did everything come to be? Was shipyard first and then the and then the dow what is the relationship do you have like proposals that are governed by this now where do you I, there's I have so many questions i don't even know where to start sure so i'll i'll start with a story so uh so i got into crypto in 2017 um and i started an early nft protocol um that's when I first got in um, and realized kind of this wild world of, of crypto. Um, and I think one of the most exciting, you know, fast forward a few years, one of the most exciting things is, is DeFi. You know, I generally feel like, uh, you know, the most impactful thing in humanity, and I don't think this is unique in crypto, is, is uh, shared prosperity. Markets create shared prosperity. And when people have like shared purpose, um, when people have shared prosperity, they can advocate for their own political rights, right? I don't really believe in like trying to give political rights to people who don't have them. That just is inherently colonial uh, and imperialist. I believe in like helping them get prosperous and then they they claim their their own political power. And I have an old friend, Abe Offman. We were in college together at Harvard and, uh, and, and he shared this kind of same vision uh, and purpose. Um, and he also kind of uh, is one of the foundational thinkers in automated market making, which is technology behind decentralized exchanges. So uh, he actually wrote his PhD thesis on it in 2008. Um, it's cited in all the Uniswap white papers, you know, and and some of Vitalik's writing. I mean, it's it's very foundational on automated market making. Of course, crypto wasn't around at the time. So it's kind of coincidence that it now is that underlying the, you know, much of the... Uh, the DeFi space. Um, and so we decided that that we wanted to build more of these DEXs. That's where we thought we could contribute the most and, and a great way to create shared prosperity. So we created Shipyard Software to develop these decentralized exchanges. Now, our vision for how the, the DeFi space will place out, play out 
is not that there's going to be like a one size fits all exchange, right? I don't think Uniswap is going to be like the only place where people go to trade because when you design for all, you're best for none. And the way traditional finance has worked out is there's uh, there's a bunch of different exchanges. Like even New York Stock Exchange has like five or 10 different exchanges, one for large cap equities, one for small cap, one for debt. And so we want to build these specialized exchanges that are actually best for specific types of users. And uh, and so that's how we discovered Shipyard. Um, or that's how we decided to start Shipyard. Interesting. So fast forward to now, we've developed our first DEX. Uh, it's called Clipper. And it has the best prices for retail trades. And how we do this is basically a set of design trade-offs. Um, in particular, we we cap the liquidity pool. So we don't let a lot of TVL in. There's, some, there's this misconception in the space that TVL is good. And that's just not true hmm. uh always and it's especially not good for retail traders tvl matters more for whales and big trades than it does for small trades for small trades you're just going to end up paying higher fees than you need to to motivate like a billion dollars of liquidity right but you can actually balance fees and slippage and it turns out for small trades it's better to have a, a kind of smaller cap pool so that's that's how we did it it's really about focus and um and so Clipper is, you know, now it, it has the best prices for small trades, right? It tends to block bots, it blocks whales, or it just kind of is a bad place for whales to trade. And so it's really a place where smaller traders can come where they're the priority and not the prey. Um, so that's Clipper. And then uh, and then obviously th- there's a DAO that, that is actually governing Clipper. And this DAO also... Uh, governs a couple other decentralized exchanges that that we're developing, um, which I can speak to further, but maybe I'll stop for a moment so I don't ramble too much. Remind me to go back to the conversation about shared prosperity. Uh, and I, cause I really truly believe that building out that equal playing field is what got me into Bitcoin all those years ago. I saw an, an equal playing field for me personally to join the financial world as an equal to the, this, these large amounts of, of capital that can sling all their money around and do whatever they want, but there's no, it's not equal for, for the rest of us. I want to get back to that, but this is very interesting because you actually, uh, back to Clipper and, and the Admiral Dow, you've actually incentivized whales to become like sponsors or like, I saw this as a recent thing. So it's like, you're not Mm -hmm. disincentivizing whales per se or large liquidity providers. Uh, you're almost like funneling them to a different type of of uh, of yield. Yeah, that's right. So, um, so one of the hardest things in DeFi is actually uh, having a protocol be sustainable. <laughs> yeah, and of course. There's this, <laughs> there's this like the thing is that um, most are not. Uh, I don't think that any Uniswap V2 forks are actually viable models. I don't think that LPs make enough yield uh, to cover the impermanent loss. Um, and I think that problem has been, and because of that, I don't, because LPs aren't making money, uh, you know, the liquidity really shouldn't be there. And, and if it, when that eventually people realize that and they figure out this impermanent loss fallacy, uh, I think the capital will flow out of these, you know, Uniswap forks and CPMMs, constant product market makers, and then prices will get terrible and they just they'll go into market failure. Um and so uh you know, so 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 it's it's actually very tough to see what models are sustainable throughout DeFi. And we've been very focused on making a model that's sustainable and then having faith that'll be successful. So uh so a DEX is a two-sided market. You have traders and you have liquidity providers, right? The traders come because you're getting them good prices. Um and you're not screwing them. The liquidity providers come because they're getting good yield. Okay. Now, if too many liquidity providers come, it dilutes the yield. Maybe that's fine, but in the case of Clipper, too much liquidity actually results in worse prices. So we cap the liquidity pool. And what that means is actually like as trades come, that accrues trading fees. And since you know, we only have like, you know, 10 to 20 million in, in capital in Clipper, uh, the yields just like start going through the roof, right? 
Yeah. Now, it's not like you can do yields on a billion dollars of capital, but that's okay. The Clipper doesn't need a billion dollars of capital. So we have these enormous yields on 10 to 20 million capital. And so it's like, well, how do you allocate that? Right. And one way you can allocate that, you, you can't let every, everyone in because it'll break the design. There'll be too much liquidity. So how do you allocate that? Well, one thing we've done is if you, you know, we the, the priority, the true north is retail traders. So if you put in under $10,000 in liquidity, like that's fine. Above that, you can't take more allocation in the pool, but anyone can put in $10,000. So then we said, well, look, some people need to put in more. And by the way, the protocol needs profit. Yeah. So if you want to put in more than $10,000, great. You have to out, you have to donate half of your uh, yield to the DAO. And that is still worthwhile for people because the yields are sufficiently high that it, that it works. And so that is the business model, right? Instead of charging a little extra on a trade, uh, you basically say, look, liquidity providers above the market cost of capital, right? Why should you be getting more? Uh, you know, and if you're a retail trader, sure, we want you to have it. But, but you know, if you want more, well, that should be, that's profit to the protocol. And so I think on percentage terms, Clipper is the most profitable DEX on the market. Um, and that's great because it means it's actual, actually sustainable. Did you hear about those... Uh... I forgot what they're called, like uh, flood images, not flood images, drought images, basically because the world has been going through you know, massive droughts, climate change, whatever political side you fall on. Uh, a lot of like old lakes and rivers have been going down. Liquidity has been drying up, right? And what they're finding is these like carved images in the beds of these rivers and lakes from thousands of years ago because warning of like, hey, if the water gets this low, shit's about to hit the fan. Uh, someone, it's almost like that's what happened to DeFi about a year ago. Liquidity in the macro situation dried up. And so money could only stick around in like the best, most profitable places. And that's why we saw a lot of DeFi kind of collapsing. And so by limiting, and so you looked at that and you said by limiting the amount of money that can be in each of the pools that are for very specific purposes, for a very specific type of trades, we could, almost doesn't matter if we're in a bull or bear market anymore. It doesn't matter if we're going through a drought or like, you know, excess rain or whatever. That's right. I mean, there's this false presumption that that the more liquidity, the better. Everyone's competing for the same, for, for the same liquidity. And that's just not always the case. It's the case for some... You know, it's kind of the problem with vanity metrics. People are like volume, 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 yeah. right? And so it's like, how do you get volume? Well, I guess you get really large traders. How do you get really large traders? We need tons of liquidity so they can make large trades and get low slippage, which means better prices. Okay, great. But like, if that's what you're focused on, then like, you're not actually focused on what's best for small traders. And what's best for small traders? Well, I guess low, like, they don't need that much liquidity because they're small trades. Yeah. They want low fees. And so it's you got to pick your true north and then make all your decisions to optimize towards that. And that is competitive differentiation. Uh, and, you know, the irony here is that large traders tend to be uh, more like very informed. They're like hedge funds. They're probably, you probably don't want to be trading with them. Uh, and retail traders are actually like, they're just trying to do their everyday business. You know, they're, they're noise trades. It's why Robinhood trade flow is valuable. And uh, actually all the profits um, in DeFi probably come from retail traders. And so there really should be a place where like they get the advantage yeah. of that instead of subsidizing whales. Hey guys, I want to take a second and talk to you about our newest sponsor, angelblock.io. It's about that time in the bear market that we actually have to take a look at which projects have taken the do's and the don'ts from all the previous waves, bull and bear markets that we've had and built out real decentralized projects that are gonna be successful and take this blockchain and crypto world that we're into the next level. Traditional fundraising is very clunky and traditional investing in crypto is very clunky as well. I know, I'm a VC at Drew Adventures. AngelBlock is really, really cool and it's a new DeFi protocol that's solving not only the issues of fundraising for digital assets, but more compliance, transparency, real decentralization. They have on-chain governance, staking, lending, 
secondary marketplaces for the trading of tokens. All these different ways that you can actually interact with the startup and the token and the project that you're actually investing in. There's a whole community here. AngelBlock is that new compliant platform that's safe and easy to use in order to weed out all the scams. It's so cool. It's built on top of Ethereum, but it's multi-chain by design. <clears throat> They'll also be involved in the mentoring process. There's a phenomenal community that AngelBlock has built. It doesn't cost anything. Go check out the community. Go to their website, angelblock.io. Sign up to their email to stay up to date. You'll have a chance to win some really cool Angel Block NFTs. And this is only for Untold Stories listeners. Thank you, guys. Speaking speaking of which, I uh, I want to pull up this statistic that I just read like an hour ago. Um, it was a Bloomberg summary. More regulation, more appeal. The conclusion crypto traders came in at the latest MLIV Pulse survey that, that is run by Bloomberg. 60% of the 500 respondents, 564 respondents indicated they view the recent spate of legal action in crypto as a positive sign for the asset class. Uh, they're saying that the more regulation, the more, the, the better, right? But for like a decade, we've always looked at these like uh, shots of enforcement as, as like a negative policy act, but, but, you know, and I kind of point to uh, two things. You have securities tokens and you have OFAC compliance, the whole tornado cash thing. Um, let's talk about the tornado cash thing for a second, because you guys really make it a very big point that these decentralized exchanges are OFAC compliant. What is OFAC and why is it a positive thing that this is how it seems that regulation is going towards that, that direction? Why is that a good thing? That's a great question. Maybe I'll start from the beginning and just fast forward me if if uh, if this is too much context. But, you know, there are things in society. We have laws because we all kind of agree as people that there are things in society that are bad <laughs> and and the things that are society that are not bad. Okay, and I think things that we can all agree are bad are like child trafficking, terrorism, drug cartels, you know, like there, there's just, I, I think we can all agree that that's bad. Um, and then there's some stuff that's also bad, like, you know, people getting, uh, people getting, losing all their retirement savings in a fraud, Ponzi schemes, you know, like, like, yeah lying i think those things we can all agree are bad and so the point of False regulation, advertising of, of yeah. medicine or cigarettes or things like that there's all yeah we have regulations for a reason yeah like we have regulations for a reason we decided these are like the shared norms and ethics and values that we've agreed on society so like that's really the purpose of like laws and then the regulations that kind of specify these laws how exactly these laws should apply and so i think those are good things i think the idea that you can be like look uh no one's like we're not responsible the free market will like you know solve this is is kind of irresponsible it's like well sure but we're all responsible we all have to do everything we can to prevent things that we all agree are bad and uh and so in that sense regulation is good now uh now ofac is the way that our society uh has like come together and said here's how we're going to stop it and basically you know, the US government, US Treasury has a list of like, do not do business with these people. And these are like the worst of the worst. Yeah. Right? These aren't like marginal. Everyone we can agree on the OFAC list is like a pretty bad dude. And, uh, and you know, and then basically like, if you want to do any US bank uh, cannot do business with those people and cannot do business with people who do business with those people. So if you want to do business with US banks, namely trade the dollar or hold dollars, then you have to respect OFAC. And so that's what OFAC is. Now, uh, that's how they kind of impose it into the traditional finance uh, sphere. And by the way, it's strict liability. It's not like SEC, right? It's strict yeah. liability. It's like, we don't care if you intended to, we don't care if you know, it was negligence. If you did it, you're liable, Yeah. right? Totally different from kind of SEC stuff. And, uh, and I think that's really important. I think that's fair. And so uh, Clipper, um, 
screens every trade against the OFAC blacklist. And if it's an OFAC blacklisted address, uh, you know, the trade doesn't go through. Now, it costs a little more gas. And a lot of, you know, Uniswap designed their protocol and a bunch of other, you know, projects have designed sure. their protocol to do that on the front end. But I think developers should be responsible and should screen against OFAC on-chain. Uh, you know, it's just the right thing to do. Um, and so this that's is... what Clipper does. And it also makes it easier for institutional capital and, and you know, anyone who, who cares about compliance themselves to to use the service because they know their money's not going to mix with people who it's not allowed to mix with. And, and actually, it turns out a lot of people, and especially institutions, care about that a lot. This is, it's a, and the next, depending on who you talk to, the next conversation of debate is, okay, you know, I agree on everything you just said, but should that compliance be on the actual blockchain itself governed by the validators of that chain who are supposed to be just validating the chain and now they have to, or should it be done? Like, where does that compliance fall now? Because there's always been a relationship of just two consumer business, you know, like two relationships, but now there's like a third. It's very complicated. Yeah. I think it would be best if it happens at the validator level. That seems great. Um, it's It probably makes the most sense. Um, and that seems to be happening. I mean, I saw some chart recently where like, you know, a, a, a majority of validators are, are OFAC compliant validators now. Yeah. And they just won't confirm transactions from OFAC listed addresses. Now, like we can quibble over the margin on Tornado Cash. Okay. But put that aside, like my basic attitude is, you know, people say, hey, the free market should decide this. And so like, you know, any given person shouldn't have responsibility. This is the free market, <laughs> right? Yeah. And so like that, like the validator is doing that. That's part of the free market. Exactly. Clip are doing that. So that's, that's part of the free market. And everyone that... should try to, and then we see what's most effective. That's a very good point. Part of the free market is these validators. Part of the free market is the consensus of these chains that say, hey, we want to do this. It's not like, you know, by you coming and saying, you need to follow these set of rules and standards that blockchains need to be, then you're essentially forcing your will onto all other blockchains of the future. But but it was almost like the vision of Satoshi that everyone should be able to decide what works for them and what doesn't, equal playing field. It, that's, that goes to not just like, hey, the playing field is built, now it's equal, it's building out the field itself needs to be equal uh, as well. And that's, it's a really cool thing. Um, it, actually, I was going back to being a VC. We have a member of our, on our we have a member of our, uh, of our investment committee at our fund, Jew Adventures. And as you know, on these investment committees of these funds, you need to have some people who like are just the automatic no people, right? Like we have one guy who really doesn't believe that crypto should even exist at all on our investment committee of a crypto fund. Um, and we were being pitched a, a crypto hybrid crypto bank that exists on the blockchain. And one of the things he was saying, well, he was like saying, well, you have to pay extra for compliance of OFAC. And if, if the transaction is done on chain and the entrepreneur responded and he said, no, you don't, because this blockchain does it on their own built into the chain itself. And the guy was like a former investment banker. He's like, "Wow, I totally see blockchains now. Like why it's going to be amazing now. He finally it clicked in that moment. Yeah, I think it's I think that's like a great realization. And, uh, you know, it's funny that that's the thing that made it click. Right. Actually. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, you think about it like so much of these traditional finance institutions, so much of their income state they're like expenses and just like the, the bureaucracy that makes them move slowly and you know is compliance and our current model is like as a society is we put the burden of compliance onto these financial intermediaries but it's where it's where a lot of costs you know happen it's why it's hard for them to bank the underbanked because like it's hard to do compliance on the underbanked like oh, yeah. how do you kyc someone who doesn't have an id well that's kind of a tough one Right. And so the idea that you can bake, you can put this into the infrastructure level. Right. And then like financial intermediaries or, or VASP or whatever you want to call them, 
can kind of like operate with that as just a given is actually like amazing. It's a, it's a much better paradigm. That's what I, I think regulators are gradually coming around to and legislators is that like actually crypto can be more compliant and better and unleash innovation in a, in a more compliant way than the traditional system, which is actually like just insanely porous <laughs> and burdensome. I'm actually, look, there's like a whole statistic that would freak people out. If you just Google like disenfranchisement, whether it's like felony disenfranchisement, whether it's like inequality based on various prejudice, prejudices, uh, 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 like, you know, uh, where you're born, how you're born, various socioeconomic status, uh, 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 all these different things, you know, everyone knows the financial system is so, so prejudiced against mostly everyone like you have to fit into like a certain mold and a lot of that comes down to like risk and compliance oh yes you know 50 years ago every single bank in the country maybe it was a little bit more than that was basically saying oh you live in a black neighborhood you can't get a mortgage because it's risky like you were you were having that so if we did anything at all and make if we've like 10 years later we've succeeded at just making compliance more transparent fair free of embezzlement and graft and racism and stuff like that then i feel like that's success right it, it's not just success it's the in my opinion one of the most impactful ways you can make a difference in society i mean you know there's we can fight racism directly one person by one person but redlining which is what you described is probably more responsible for the the you know, I, I'm not a historian on the matter, but is one of the major factors that has impacted wealth disparity between uh, racial wealth disparity in the U.S. Like, you know, that that is because like most of the wealth generation over the past 50 years has been in like house home value and real estate appreciation. But Afri the African-American community couldn't access mortgages because of redlining. And so they couldn't buy homes. And so they didn't generate from that, you know, generational wealth. Yeah, exactly. And, like these little things are the things that actually enabled shared prosperity to our, our comment earlier that then enable people to advocate for their own political rights and seize their per, their own power um and i think it's it's sometimes seems boring but is actually the stuff that matters most how do you think that um like our future and are you building your company now for to will there be do you think there'll be multiple chains in the future that you're going to have to almost uh, manage the relationship between all of them? Or will capital, kind of going back to the lake and what we were talking about earlier, we're in this like post cheap money world now that has been going on since people argue since 2001. So maybe for 20 years, do you think that uh, capital is just going to sit on some of the largest chains and that's where all the development will happen? It's a really good question and, and the truth is i'm not sure i think there are going there are definitely going to be multiple chains because like all things different chains make different technical trade-offs and different technical trade-offs are useful for different services right and, and applications some applications you know speed's incredibly important but like security isn't like a game you know and some applications security is really important but speed isn't like sending very large amounts of money waiting a few minutes is like okay you know and because of that there's going to be multiple chains and if there's multiple chains then there's going to have to be kind of a, a a system where applications can move between these chains or at least interoperate similar to how we have different operating systems now i want to um, develop a like a hyper secure blockchain like i have to sit and map it out but that has like one day block times on purpose and it's just going to be for like super assets like very very uh expensive or rare type of things just to prove out like faster is not always better that's right it's better for some things it's better for others and and everything involves trade-offs that's right and uh and so i you know i think because of that there's going to be a multi-chain world but i also think network effects are really important so like it's amazing to me that you know how much staying power ethereum has despite its drawbacks because right. just everyone's there. And so I, I definitely think there's going to be dominant, uh, you know, chains. Um, 
and you know we're we're generally we've been ethereum first but uh but clipper is going to be cross chain um you know be be on all chains eventually what chains so, do you, are you seeing the most like developer activity that you'd say okay if we had to be like three chains right now other than ethereum you would be you would you know be agnostic or whatever oh good question i mean we're the clipper is ethereum optimism polygon soon to be arbitrum um from there i haven't really done the research to really know but i'll just list off in no specific order priority you know the name why optimism like, uh well it's it kind of rounds out the ethereum layer 2 ecosystem um i think that's this is interesting I oh heard why this. optimism as as not why arbitrum um i i like the team i respect the team you know kevin's a great guy uh and um you know and and they had an emerging ecosystem and i think it's like always good to launch into where there's there's not a dominant player already because you know it helps synergistically you can like kind of grow the ecosystem alongside yeah um and uh and so we were excited about optimism um the last real question i had for you that i want to it was more a personal question too is that so you have a lot of people that maybe want to join you at shipyard maybe it's in the dow maybe it's just as a they want to work in marketing or as a developer they want to be involved in in organization uh, community ecosystem what would be the best way traditionally like a job posting contact you guys what's the best step yeah i think there is uh two answers to that question so i'm glad you asked it one is roles we're actually a shipyard is hiring for and you can go to shipyardsoftware.org, link to our angel list, you know, uh, career postings. Talk to us that way. Also go into our Discord uh, or go to Clipper's Discord and, uh, you know, and you can ping us. But broader than that, um, you know, Admiral Dow, our goal for Admiral Dow is that it is, um, it governs not just Clipper, but multiple DEXs that uh, share R&D, and best practices and so there's other dexes that are that are going to be governed by admiral dow um interesting and if you are a developer and you're developing a dex and you want support uh or you want to plug in a kind of shared governance platform to your own dex without constraining yourself in any way um you know i encourage you to reach out because you you can kind of join admiral dow Oh my um, God, that's so cool. In many ways, you can think of Admiral Dow as, as a Knights of the Round Table of Dex Builders. Um, and uh, and it's a round table, right? That's that's why. What about liquidity for securities tokens? I mean, there's a lot to unpack there. And I know we're running out of time, but I mean, I, don't, I can't wrap my head around how this is going to work. For tokens that are, that are clearly securities. Sure. So you're going to have like, a token there already exists on like inx platform or if you go to sto market there already exist walled garden decentralized exchanges that once you're accredited you're inside and you can freely buy and sell any token and trade and things like that but what will be the relationship between those and the non-secure security tokens that already trade on decentralized exchanges will it just be like a a, a wall between them i think this again, goes back to the idea that different use cases for DEXs require different market microstructures. Sure, and yeah. it is very clear that a, a security token demands a different market microstructure, right? To have maximum liquidity for security tokens, you're going to want people, you're going to want to include people who care about compliance, right? Because a lot of the big buyers do. And in order to do that, you're going to have certain features. And I think, uh, you know, let's just talk about the US, one of those features is transfer restrictions in, in the first year of a security. Put that aside, right? Let's say you're after the first year. Still, those security tokens kind of need to like, you know, go to buyers who are appropriate buyers. There There's a trend for agent check. who has to like govern yeah. the rules around all the transactions almost in real time. So you can create like a transfer agent DAO too. Yes. There's a lot that's kind There's of a happening. A lot that's happening. Yeah. yeah, you can, you know, you can create a federated 
KYC system, a federated uh, accreditation system. But um, and I think like those have to be built into the core of a DEX if it's for security tokens. And the truth is, I don't think security tokens are like a big enough market to have made any of those security specific protocol successful yet, will but I think they will be. Yeah. yeah. And I think they will be once uh, crypto wealth starts caring about buying security tokens until oh, yeah. that's the case, like the, the cost of capital and the yields demanded for capital in crypto are still so high that the yields from actual security tokens just aren't high enough to make crypto wealth care about it. And so that's I think that's why point. they haven't taken out yet, taken off yet. That's a very good point. There are some projects out there that are offering above 10% yield that are like secured against revenue sharing of real estate rentals and things like that. There's still a lot of fear behind them, but maybe potentially those down. But that's all the time we have. Mark Lurie, thank you so much for coming on Untold Stories today. I really appreciate it. Thank you. And uh, maybe just to um, to leave the listener with how they can follow if they'd like to, if you don't mind a brief shill. Uh, my Twitter is at Mark Lurie, M-A-R-K-L-U-R-I-E. Um, you can also follow Clipper at, at Clipper underscore Dex. Um, and then uh, our next step, Dex, Longship, which lets you, uh, it's derivatives, but rethought for DeFi in an AMM with no order book, which it has profound implications, um, is called Longship. And if you're interested in learning more about this, which I think is completely just really, really fascinating, um, you can learn uh, more about Longship by following Longship's Twitter, uh, which is um, Longship underscore Phi. So I encourage you to do that as well. What about you're staying with the theme too? It's we build ships, yeah. but uh, <laughs> once they're off, the community governs them on the high seas. I love that. And thousands of years later, we're still relying on marine transport, like the oceans and the ships and everything. It's like the one thing that hasn't changed. About yeah, it's amazing. All right, Mark. Thank you. Thank you. All I'll right. talk to you later. Thanks Bye. so much.